All right. Um, I'll just kick off from last night and um, uh, add just a few things. First Timothy chapter 6 and 12 quickly. Um, Paul, uh, we said the background of this is he's talking to a minister. And I said yesterday that this is his most trusted son. And which means that there's no time that we don't need caution. Um, caution is a fabric of the gospel that we believe and also the gospel that we preach. Um, so in 1 Timothy 6, 12, quickly, um, Paul says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and thou hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I'll just take a few minutes to uh, do a brief uh, overview of just uh, Bible interpretation, just something small. Um, sometimes a word can be used in the same sentence and they have two different applications and meanings. Um, I know yesterday night I didn't have much time to uh, maybe uh, pick out that word faith, why in that text it's faithfulness. But let me just give a background of the use of words. If you look at First Corinthians and chapter 2, for example, Paul uses the word spiritual in, a, in two different ways. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1, he says, when I came to you, I came not in the excellency of speech of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. He said, I was with you, I said, well, I decided not to do anything amongst you, verse 2, except Christ and him crucified. When I was with you, I was with more weakness, fear, and trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. So the first time he uses the word spirit there is for preaching, the message that he preached. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the first use of the word spirit in the entire First Corinthians. It's for preaching. Then he says in 6, I'll be, we speak the wisdom among them that are perfect, not the wisdom of this world, prince of this world that come to nothing. He said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He says in verse 8, he says, which none of these prince of this world known, as they known it, they will not have crucified the Lord of glory. As it's written in verse 9, I have not seen, he has not heard, neither has it entered into the house of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So he says, but God, now that verse 9 obviously is not talking to everybody. He's talking to those who don't believe the gospel. No, no, not to, it's not about the Old Testament precisely. It's just saying that everyone who doesn't receive this wisdom of God is because I hasn't seen it, the hairs haven't heard it, uh, heard it, heard it, and then the, the mind hasn't conceived it. So in 10, it says, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. See the second time, spirit? First one is preaching. The second one is also preaching. It says, for what things know the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. The sins of God knows no man, but the spirit of God. He says, but we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So two things have happened there. He's saying we got to know what Christ has done by the spirit. He now says, by getting to know what Christ has done, we have also received uh, the, the, the spirit of God. Not to know the things of the world, but the things which are of God that are freely given to us of God with things which we speak or teach, not in the wisdom which man teach it, but with the Holy Ghost teach it, comparing... Now, notice now, he has changed spirit now from communication now to what we have received. Okay? So by the time he says comparing spiritual with spiritual, he has used spiritual for two things. Spiritual for communication and spiritual for the person who received the communication. So spiritual is used for both the information of the gospel and the recipient of the gospel. So you can use spiritual both for the gospel and then for the believer. So he says comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Say so the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God because they are spiritual and they are foolishness unto him. You know, that's the natural man. So, but the spiritual man, verse 15, he says judges all things. So the spiritual man there is the man who has received the spirit of God. He says he judges all things, yet himself he's judged of no man. Of course, when you say he's judged of no man, it doesn't mean we don't judge believers. It simply means the man who is not saved cannot properly judge a man that is born of God. All right? Because we judge believers. All right? Believers are judged, and we're told to judge what believers say. So he says, but who has known the man of the Lord, verse 16, that he might uh, instruct him? 
He says, we have the mind of Christ. So, in other words, the, the gospel came to us by spiritual communication. And by the time we receive the gospel, we are also called spiritual. Does it make sense? Habit, brethren, chapter 3, verse 1. I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So, a, a man can use the same word and has two different meanings in the same sentence. It, it's the same way you look at the word faith. Right? Faith can both be believing or what you have believed. It can also be faithfulness. You get that. Now, for example, Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth. In whose eyes, before whose eyes, Jesus Christ evidently set forth and crucified among you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Have you begun in the spirit that you now seek to be perfected in the flesh? Now, he's saying by the hearing of faith. Now, what faith is he talking about? He can say the hearing of your believing. No, that doesn't make sense. That will take you back to chapter 2, verse 20, when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, he can say, I live by the faith of the Son of God. If it's believing, he means, that means I live by the believing of the Son of God. No. It has to be, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself. Because by saying he loved me and gave himself, that means the faith has to belong to the Son of God. His faithfulness. So sometimes, faith can mean believing. It can also mean what I have believed. What I have believed is his faithfulness. So he loves me, he loved me and gave himself. That is faithfulness. Let me see if you're following what I'm saying here. So a word can be used differently, even though, you know, it has about the same, um, uh, about the same phrase. The same thing, he now gets to chapter 5, talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and now talks about faith. You know, he calls everything faith, then he says fruit of the Spirit, part of it is faith. So that means there's faithfulness of conduct, there's faithfulness in the gospel that we have believed. The faithfulness of the gospel is not my believing, it's God's action. So I am not kept by my believing, I'm kept by his faithfulness. So sometimes the word faith can mean Faithfulness, it can mean believing. So, it's the same way righteousness. Righteousness is primarily taught as a gift, right? A gift of righteousness, for example, Romans 5.17. But righteousness is also conduct. For example, the entire, the entire 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, righteousness is used primarily and only for right doing. When he says, instruction is... In righteousness, for example, 2 Timothy 3, 15, it's instruction to do the right thing. Because the word instruction there is child training, to raise a child and train him by a father till adulthood. Instruction in right doing. He says, who will give the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8, is not the crown of who you are in Christ, the crown of doing the right thing. So sometimes righteousness will mean who you are in Christ, a gift and sometimes it also refers to conduct. For example, when Paul says that, when you give, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and he says that God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you have it all sufficient, all things are bound to every good work. Then he says, he that uh, remembers the poor, takes care of the poor, he says his righteousness abides forever. That's not who you are in Christ. That is what you have just done right. All right. So righteousness is both useful. It's used for what I've done right. But primarily for what God has done right. What has God done right? God has justified me because I believed. So I received that gift. But then it's also what I do. Right? I haven't believed the gospel. What I do is also called righteousness. Paul prays that you increase Philippians 1 and 9 to 11. The fruit of righteousness. That's to do the right thing. Am I making sense here? So never give a singular definition to any word. Words only mean what they mean the way they are used. For example, I like using this example. 
uh, you have a board meeting, and the bishop here, he's the chairman. I'm your personal secretary. I'll be honored to be there. And then uh, Pastor Seka here is the vice chairman. So they are seated together. And he calls me. He says, um, what do you have for me? He's my chairman. Then I say, that's your cup of tea. I'd better show you a cup of tea or I get the gates and get another job. That means if I don't point to you a cup of tea immediately, I just told you that's your business. So a word can have two different meanings. It depends on where it is used. Uh, that's why the, 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 the most important form of Bible study isn't exactly just knowing Greek and Hebrew words. That's, fine. that's cool. It's actually reading contextually. Reading uh, and contextual reading demands the patience that many people don't want to give it to it. Contextual study of scripture requires a lot of patience because you might spend longer than usual on just a text of the Bible. It, it takes a lot. It's not, it's, not, it's not saying, oh, this is what is this. No, no. You probably need to take some time and think through and then read through and because most of the Bible isn't written in chapters and verses. The Bible wasn't numbered. Even the book of Numbers was not numbered. So it's just a singular. The way it's read is called the scriptural continua. Keep reading. That's the way they used to study. Just keep reading. Don't stop. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. So, but the verses have, you know, maybe compromise our attention. By the time you stop in the verse, you just think, I've stopped. But really, you ought to read from the beginning to the very end. So you see the use of those words and used very differently. Just like the word uh, spiritual, like I mentioned now, spiritual is for communication. It's also used for individuals. But interesting in Ephesians 6, Paul used it for spiritual wickedness. How about that? <laughs> in the heavenly, spiritual wickedness. And by the time he says in Ephesians 6 and 12, uh, you say, what do you mean by spiritual wickedness? Ephesians 1, 3, spiritual blessings. How can you not say spiritual wickedness? Because in Ephesians 2 and 1, it says, you as he quickened who were dead in your trespasses and sins, who walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit. So by the time he uses spiritual in chapter 6, 12, your mind should go to chapter 2, verse 2. Does it make sense? Uh, it's not the Holy Ghost now. It's now <laughs> evil spirit. So the word faith doesn't always mean I believe. For example, when you have the phrase, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, Hebrews 10, 38. When you hear the just shall live by faith, the background of that statement is in Habakkuk 2 and 4. Habakkuk 2 and 4 is about the prophet Habakkuk speaking about someone who He's going to come. He will tarry. He will not tarry. He will come. It's for an appointed time. And he picks the phrase appointed time from Genesis. Genesis 19, I believe. 9. Where Sarah was said, it will visit her at the appointed time. A phrase used for the Messiah. And so by saying it's for an appointed time, he's simply saying the Christ will come. And so the soul of the proud is just lifted up in this, lifted up his Lift it up in him, the seal of the those who is not doesn't justify this. Lift it up in him, and they say, But the just shall live by faith. Now, the reason why that happened like that, and people get confused, is because they often don't read what he was saying before. If he says, Someone is coming, he won't tarry, he will come. Then he says, The just shall live, it has to be by his faithfulness. That is, whoever is justified. In the Old Testament, even though they will die, when the Messiah will come, the just shall live by his faithfulness. Because when he's raised from the dead, they'll be raised with him in glory. So it's a promise for the Old Testament saints that they're justified, yes, by believing the gospel, but by the faithfulness of God in that the promise he made to them, he'll raise Christ from the dead. The justified shall live by his faithfulness. So every time you read that, it's talking about God's faithfulness, not your believing. Let me see if you understand that. So always stick to the contextual use of words. Right? So most of the time, I said yesterday, people are angry with God about things he never promised. 
you know, and they thought God promised it because that's how they read it. And so, no matter how deep you are in prayer, God won't do what he never promised. So let's say that again. No matter how sincere and deep you are in prayer, God will never do what he didn't promise. He sticks with his word. All right, so in 1 Timothy 6 and 12, by saying, fight the good fight of faithfulness. In other words, why he said that was because he said to Timothy, he says, flee. So the fight is to flee. To run from these things, to run from the desires he highlighted in verse 9 and 10. Those that will be rich or desire to be rich, he says, will fall into many temptations. They will fall into, fall into the snare of the devil and get themselves into hurtful lust that drown men of perdition. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which some, when they converted after, have heard from faithfulness. They have refused to be consistent. They have moved from being consistent to something else. So you fight, flee from those things, okay, and then follow after godliness, faithfulness. Uh, he says, righteousness. And then he says in verse 12, fight the good fight of faithfulness. Lay hold on eternal life, which Paul oftentimes used. When Paul uses eternal life, he often uses eternal life for eternal things. Then he says, witness a good profession. You just ensure that you hold on to that profession that you have already professed. In other words, he's telling Timothy to be consistent. Don't allow uh, pressures of life. Don't allow... Uh, people preaching around you to influence what you are saved or what you're preaching. Then he, he uses Jesus as the example that before Pontius Pilate, he witnessed a good confession. So does it make sense to us now? So faith there is faithfulness. I've seen people say, oh, fight a good fight of faith uh, means to uh, hold on to who you are in Christ and then uh, when sickness comes or your body say, I don't take it in Jesus' name. That is true. You should do that, but that's not what the verse is talking about. The verse has to do with, you know, being faithful with the doctrine of Christ, being faithful with what you believe and what you profess. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at something that, you know, is also involved in that. Why? What does it mean to be faithful? It means whatever you have received, whatever is the ministry, be faithful. I'm going to highlight just two things, you know, from the same letter. Uh, the first thing is, be faithful with the utterances that have gone before on you. Hallelujah. First Timothy 1.18. Be faithful with the utterances. Prophecies, he says, gone ahead before on you. And that's not the prophecy of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. <laughs> that's a prophecy about you. It says they've gone before concerning you. In other words, one of the things we ought to remember are the things the Spirit of God had said. And the Spirit of God doesn't always talk. It's not when you knew so much in the Bible. The prophecies I, I, I write on today and I believe today are prophecies that I received even before I came into revelation knowledge. There are things that the Spirit of God has said to you. There's this attitude people have that, yes, uh, you used to preach something that wasn't totally correct. Uh, now you've come to uh, a correct application of the truth. That you seem to want to discard everything that ever happened. That's not true. Don't do that. Uh, yes, you're growing. Yes, you're getting better. But the things God said to you, and it's not doctrinal now. You know the things He said uh, at the, about the time you began ministry, and, and Paul knew much of that because in Acts 13:2. In Antioch, while they were, you know, very busy in teaching the church at Antioch himself and Barnabas and obviously more other teachers, Acts 11. It says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. It says, the Holy Ghost said, and by saying the Holy Ghost said, it's not that they just heard from the loudspeaker. Oh, the Lord. The Holy Ghost said, from the Old Testament through the epistles, is talking about prophecy. So by saying, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul. One of the characteristics of a New Testament church or any church at all that is founded in Christ is that it is, it is 
overwhelmed or it swims in supernatural utterances. If you pastor a church and a whole month, a whole year, and there are no prophecies, I'm not talking about you know, fake prophecies now, prophecies, intimations about the Holy Spirit, then there's something wrong. Because one of the apostolic instructions in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, is follow after charity. Uh, it's about desire spiritual gifts and much more that you prophesy. A local church that doesn't desire prophecy can't be in the will of God. In verse 39, it says, covet to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues. All those instructions have to do with church gatherings. So, a church of Christ is such that, is, you see, the entire Bible, the Old Testament is a book of utterances. It came by utterances. In other words, a local church is a place where utterances are given very good space. And so, it's important that we don't have a church that talks down on the gifts of the Spirit. You see, you won't be any better because of fakes to now denounce the original. You ought to know that the gifts of the Spirit, the power gifts, revelation gifts, utterance gifts, are a fabric of the gospel. The grace of God is God's character, one, to save by giving his son, to die, to be raised from the dead, and the grace of God also is his spirit in us and his spirit walking through us in the gifts of the spirit. So a grace message without the gifts of grace is not the grace message of Jesus. It has to have the things of the spirit in there, which includes the utterances, the revelations, and power. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. For you were Gentiles carried by dumb idols wherein you were led. But I give you to understand, verse 3, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5, there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. Verse 6, there are diversities of operations, but the same God that walketh all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every preacher, no, every man that is in the church, to profit with to one is given the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom by the same spirit. To another, he's given the walkings of miracles, gifts of healings. He says the, the, the tongues, the of tongues, the diversity of tongues. Then he says prophecy and the gift of faith. He says, well, all this, verse 11, walk at the one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So that must be an emphasis of the local church. The local church must teach, practice the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are not crusade, crusade elements. They are the fabric of the teaching of the church. Can I have an amen here? So in those meetings, therefore, where you, know, you, you can have the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. This sign, Semyon, Semyon in the Greek means an indicator of a message. This indicator of the message that you believe shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. That means the walks of the devil. They will take the dead things and hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick should recover. So, the gospel is preached with the signs of the gospel. The signs of the gospel in Mark 16 are power and awful utterances. You know, it's all there. So, if you uh, hold the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of Christ has the power of Christ, the spirit of Christ. It rests upon the doctrine of Christ. And so, in verse, verse 20 of the same chapter, Mark 16, 20, and it says, they went for everywhere, preaching the word, and God, Lord, confirming the word which they preached with signs following. Verse 20 is the summary of the book of Acts. So, in writing to Timothy, don't forget, is a reminder. He says, utterances have gone before on you, that with them you wage a good warfare. So, there are utterances, things said 
by the Holy Ghost. Things said by the Spirit. To you. Paul remembered that. Acts 13. He says there were prophets in Antioch and teachers. And two, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work where to I have called them. That's an utterance. Where was the work he's referring to? Acts 9. So prophecies sometimes come to remind you. They remind you of things you probably heard from God when you were in the school, maybe university, college of education, or even secondary school. Prophecies can come as a reminder. They can come as revelation. There are some times like that, a man will walk up to you by the Spirit of God, and he'll, he'll remind you, God, God laid this on your heart to go to this country, this village, this town, to do this. And you probably have forgotten. You've been enmeshed in different kind of things. So prophecies can come to remind you. Am I making sense here? And that happened in Acts 13. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I've called them. They went forth. And you know, in verse 4, when they laid hands on them and sent them away, Luke says they were sent by the Holy Ghost. They were sent by the Holy Ghost. Hands were laid, words were said. That's the local church. The ministry of the laying on of hands is so prominent that if you don't lay hands as a minister of the gospel, we'll say, what are you doing? Jesus laid hands. The apostles laid hands. They were going to pick deacons that laid, they laid hands. They were going to uh, ordain folks in uh, Acts 14, 23. They laid hands. Acts 13, 2, they laid hands. Acts 19, 6, they laid hands. Acts 8, 14, and 15, they laid hands. You see laying of hands all over the book of Acts. It's prominent enough for you not to miss that fact. Laid hands. As all trances were given, hands were laid. And so Paul says to Timothy, don't forget it. Now, in case you missed that, in chapter 4, um, it, it, of course, he mentioned the fact that there are seducing spirits in verse 1, in the verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. He got to 6, he says, if you put the bread in the midst of these things, you'll be a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. In verse 12, he says, let no man is past our youth, but be that an example of the believer. He says, in faith, in, in purity, in charity, in spirit. In verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Then he says, neglect not the gift. The word there is charisma. Neglect not the gift which is in you. All right? Which is given thee by prophecy and the laying of hands of the elders. In other words, he reminds him the second time. Prophecy about your call. Prophecy about your ministry. I know people have bastardized prophecy. And he says all kind of nonsense. But you see, oftentimes, not all the time, fakes exist because of the original things. And you won't do the will of God to ignore the will of God because others are abusing it. Years ago, in the 90s, I stopped laying hands because I felt it was being abused. I actually felt so because people were laying hands for crap. They lay hands on people for all kind of nonsense. So I stopped. And God reminded me. He said, why do you stop laying hands? I said, well... This guy, he was doing it. He said, you will not be obeying me by not laying hands because others are abusing it. You are actually in disobedience. So the fact that it's just the concept of people falling under the power. I've seen people say, well, you know, someone asked me a question. He says, is it scriptural to fall under the power? I said, well, people fall under the power in the Bible. Paul did. I said, well, Paul, Paul did. Uh, he wasn't a Christian. What difference does it make? If someone wrote two thoughts of the New Testament and fell under the power, you better fall under the power. You get it. People have abused it, but it doesn't make it wrong. People have abused the issue of deliverance, but casting out of devils is part of the gospel. We cast out devils. Of course, not from believers, you get the point, but we cast out devils. We we minister the revelation gifts, we minister the power gifts, because it's part of the gospel. Amen. It's the same way people have abuse given, they've called it all kinds of names, but you won't please God if you speak low on giving. You'll actually be doing worse than those who twist scriptures if you speak down on giving. Acts 4.33, it says that uh, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus says, and great grace was upon them. The grace grace was the next verse. Because they were giving. 
the great grace was there was so much given. Luke calls it great grace. You can't be a grace church. Sorry, I'm talking to you now. I'm looking at you and I'm saying grace church. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't deliberate. <laughs> you can't give, be a grace teaching church or ministry and speak down on giving. One of the qualities of a grace teaching church is that people give a lot. They give. They sell to give. They give without manipulation, without someone say, I'm looking for 10 people who will stand up now and the anointing will come upon them. No, no, that's a, that's a charlatan. That's a charlatan. You, you go straight to the point. We have a need, right? We must meet the need. Everybody gets up to do it. It's our job. It's our responsibility. A church that requires the pastor to do all the giving is not walking in the word of God. It's, not walking. it's an abuse of pastoral work if you have to do all the giving. Now, you must be exemplary, okay, and be the one to show them how to do it, but you can't be the only one doing it. Can I have an amen? amen. All right, let me go for it. So, Paul, he's reminding Timothy, hands were laid on you. Don't forget it. I remember every event that hands were laid on me. Paul asked Timothy to remember when hands were laid on him. You have to remember it. I know people have abused laying of hands, but then it's a fabric of the gospel. I remember. There is no gift of God that I know today in my life that didn't come by laying on of hands. None. Everything I do in the ministry today is because at some point, someone laid hands on me and communicated those things to me. I say it often. So I'll be the last person to play down on it. And Paul writes to his son. We saw Paul. Paul is called by God. Everybody knows it. He's a New Testament minister. But you know how he began? Hands were laid on him. Acts 13 and verse 4. Hands were laid on him and Barnabas. That's a crucial detail you mustn't forget. So he says to Timothy, don't forget. Don't forget. Timothy is already a pastor's pastor. He's in Ephesus. He's been around. He's been in Thessalonica. He was in Corinth. He was everywhere. And Paul still had the cause to remind him. Never because, you know, sometimes we go through a lot of trials and sometimes ministry can be boring. Sometimes it can be drudgery. Sometimes you can, your expectations are lost and you're, you're, you're just frustrated. And Paul writes to his son, remember, hands were laid on you. Hands were laid on you. Hands were laid on you. And utterances were given to you. Don't forget it, right? Hands were laid on you. So when you read chapter 6, verse 12, and it says, fight the good fight of faithfulness. Don't lose ground. Remember, hands were laid on you. Be faithful. So, you have to be consistent on why hands were laid on you. Hands were laid on you. Hands were laid on you. Also, what is there? Prophecies were given. Prophecies were given. In 1994, I attended a conference in Lagos, you know, uh, organized in the Lateran Assembly. In fact, it wasn't an open meeting because they, they just publicized it for the members of that particular association. I got a wind of it and I found my way there. So I got to the registration stand and the guy said, ah, you this young guy, you're not part of this place. I said, in Jesus' name, just let me enter. He said, ah, how would I allow this kind of person to enter this place? I said, don't worry, I won't make noise. I won't disturb anybody. Listen carefully. I got into the place. The entire conference was less than three, four rows here. I'm sure the guest speakers will have thought, maybe this guy came with someone and I didn't misbehave. You know, if I was dozing now, they come and call me, who are you? But I just was a lot. A man by the name of Ross Tatro, that was the, my first and last time I've seen him. He came and some other preachers preached, but he stood out and he's preaching and then he turns. Young man, come. I was the only one he prophesied to. And as he laid hands and began to prophesy, he said, can you hear what I'm saying? I said, I brought a walkman. I was recording everything you were saying. That's the diligence with which I take supernatural utterances. I, I recorded everything. I said, I mean, it's here. I can tell you exactly the things he said. And today I'm walking in the light of it, 25 years after, and more to come. You don't forget such times. They are crucial to obeying God. 
So when Paul was saying, fight the good fight of faithfulness, it included, don't forget, supernatural utterances that went before on you. Let me see if you're following what I'm saying this morning. Okay, so he says, hands were laid, utterances were given. Then he says, the gift that is in you. I know people that genuinely function as prophets. But they didn't know much. So they got themselves involved in, you know, maybe some wrong practices. And sometimes, they f somehow they felt they are no longer prophets. That's not true. You still have God's gift of a prophet. You might have got things wrong, but the knowledge is not supposed to take away your office. It's supposed to make it effective. Some people have killed the zeal to go to villages and undo the walks of darkness because it felt somewhere in their minds, no, 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 no. God still called you to do it. You have to remember it. You have to. Knowledge of the word makes you effective. There are three tests by which I run on any doctrine. Three tests. You don't have to adopt it. Can I go ahead and tell you? Three tests that I run. Number one, if a doctrine doesn't inspire us to go and win souls, I discard it. A doctrine that doesn't inspire us to go and reach the lost can't be a doctrine of Christ. Because if you want to summarize why Jesus came, it can be one word. To reach the lost. So anything that doesn't represent that can't be the doctrine of Christ. Can't be the doctrine of Christ. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16 and verse 15. Luke 24, 47. Repentance and remission of sins will preach this name among all nations. Begin at Jerusalem. There's no way you can, you can say this is a doctrine of Christ and then the next thing is that you don't reach the lost. No. We don't have a containment doctrine. We have an expansion doctrine. We're not trying to keep a set of people. We're multiplying children of God in the earth. And as a church, every day, every month, every year, you should always be thinking, how do we reach more people? How do we reach more people? How do we reach more people? Because he says, go into where? All your church? No, all the world. Brother Hagin, Kenneth Hagin used to say this. A church that doesn't evangelize cannot be in the will of God. But a church that is in evangelism is in the will of God. That's why it appears like some churches seem to have signs and wonders. Go check it. Much of the reasons why they do is because they reach out a lot. And even if you are ignorant, when you are reaching out a lot, power will accompany what you are doing. So you must know it. You must know it. Any doctrine that doesn't inspire us to go reach the lost can't be the doctrine of Christ. The second test I run. A doctrine that doesn't inspire love for the church. Love for the saints. That is a doctrine that tears down believers. Now, don't get that wrong. That doesn't mean you should not judge doctrines, all right, and be discerning, but a doctrine that tears down believers. A doctrine that can go on social media and expose people's faults can't be a doctrine of Christ. A doctrine that brings down ministries and churches can't be a doctrine of Christ. A doctrine that wants people to leave a church, everybody leaves the church to come to your church, can't be a doctrine of Christ. A doctrine that wants to multiply saints community and ensure your church doesn't exist again can't be a doctrine of Christ. No way. The doctrine of Christ seeks to what? Love. We love one another. Of course, love sometimes can be brutal in truth. But when I am brutal with my brother, I still don't treat him like an enemy. You got, get that? 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 14. You are still my brother. But, you know, we have some in-house family talk. You say, hey, what you just said is rubbish, you know, but he's still my brother. I have brothers and sisters that wear white garments. Can I have an amen? amen. Don't think the clothes of believers is suits. I, I, I preached, 
I, I preach in virtually every denomination in Nigeria I know. I've not seen any difference. I used to be a guest speaker in Aladura churches, so I know what I'm saying. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, there we have believers today who are in Catholic churches, Seventh-day Adventists. You know, we have some twisted things here and there, but equally with Pentecostal churches. So don't think that they're only your brothers if, if, if they wear suits on Sunday, they come out looking dandy and all that. We have brothers and sisters who don't wear shoes to church. Take off your shoes, they land your hands in the holy ground. So they got things wrong, wrong doctrinally speaking, but man, if they believe that Jesus died for our sins, he rose from the dead, dwells in there, they are your brothers and sisters. So a doctrine that embraces the love of God, yeah. The third one, any doctrine that speaks down on the supernatural can be the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> you can't preach Christ without the emphasis of the signs and wonders. Why do you think the book of Acts was written? From the beginning, the last chapter of the book of Acts had signs and wonders. From the first chapter till the last. It's not the message, but it's not against the message. So my three tests. One, does it inspire evangelism? Two, does it inspire love for the brethren? And finally, does it inspire the supernatural? So Paul is telling Timothy, remember, remember the gift that is in you by the laying on of hands of the elders given thee by prophecy. In fact, if you read the second letter he writes to him, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, he says, stir up the gift which is in you. Now, sometimes you might think that what you need next is to do business seminars. No. Stay of the gift that is in you. You don't need to do what the world does. Stay of the gift that is in you. Hallelujah. Stay of the gift that is in you. You don't need to do what entertainers do. You stay of the gift that is in you. Not the talent, the gift. Charismatic gift. Supernatural capacity. Teach more, preach more, pray more, stir it up. Praise God. Stir up the gift that is in you, which means don't become someone else. Just stir up the gift that is in you. So when he says, be faithful, those are the instructions in that statement. Fight the good fight of faith. Those are the instructions in that statement. The utterance have gone before you. The gift that is in you. Be faithful. Be faithful. Do you write down utterances? Do you keep them somewhere? Do you read them again and again? You know, utterances don't always have to be sweet. Some can be very bitter and cautious. And you see it. But you write it down. It says you with them wage a good warfare. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul gives a warning. Not exactly, but it's a warning. In, in verse 17, 16 says rejoice evermore. In 17 says pray without season. Then in 18, he says give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Then in 19, he says quench not the spirit. A bad translation actually. It should be quench not the fire of the spirit. In other words, there, there's, there's something called a fire of the Spirit. It's not, it's not excitement. See, if you bring in the best entertainers, people will be excited. If you bring in the best orators, people will be excited. So, the fire of the Spirit is not excitement. No. It says, quench not the fire of the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. So, the fire of the Spirit can be known by utterances do we have supernatural utterances in our assemblies things said by the spirit that can also contain revelation if that doesn't go on then there's a quenching going on in your church quench not the spirit 
Now, again, some of us are scared of these things because of the fakes. The fakes shouldn't scare you. They should embolden you to go ahead in the things of God. Because you have to contend for the faith. You have to contend for the faith. Quench not the spirit's fire. Despise not prophesying. The word despise means you have something, you don't use it. Prove all things. The word prove there means experiment. Keep experimenting the things of the spirit. And hold fast to that which is good. It's not a negative statement. It means keep holding on to utterances. In the church. The local assembly. We must give room for the demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. There are some things that the Holy Ghost will do in 10 seconds that may take 10 months to teach. What happened on the day of Pentecost requires, required Paul to write about it years later. But it had happened. And they kept, in spite of the lack of knowledge, they kept doing what God wanted them to do. They kept growing and growing. So there's sometimes the Holy Ghost will pump. And what might have taken us six months to explain. Someone's sick, he's about to die. And you, are, you want to do a series on divine healing. How to believe and receive. He will die and get the elder someone in heaven. But you can lay hands. In the name of Jesus. Sickness is gone. Now you now do a seminar. To explain what happened. So we must give room for the things of the spirit in the church. The father, how do you think Paul got to Ephesus? And then he came to the service. He saw that they were singing, Oh, when the saints go marching in, Oh, when the saints go marching He joined them. Then he also heard them say, um, Will you be ready when the Lord shall have a way? Ah, he, was, he, was still joined, he was still, you know, making guesses. On the rapture day, when the trumpet sounds, many, many people will be disappointed. Some will be crying. Some will be singing. Oh, had I known, had I known, had I known. So he was watching them. He noticed maybe two, three hours. Two days. It was just that. Then he asked the pastor. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Which means he did not see any utterances in their meetings. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Because he thought they were believers. Then they, they, they gave one of the most ridiculous answers I've ever heard. We have not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Ah, I wish we be lie. Then I asked, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, ah, to the glory of God, unto John's baptism. <laughs> Those are terrible disciples. John, listen carefully. John was the only prophet Jesus quoted about the Holy Ghost. You know, John, John, Mark, Matthew 3, 11 and 12. He says, I indeed baptized with water, but he that comes after me here now, he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mark 1 8, he baptized with the Holy Ghost. Luke 3 16, he baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John 1 33, he that baptized with the Holy Ghost. Those were the words of John. And Jesus quoted him in Acts 1 4 to 5. John very baptized with water, but on many days in shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. He was quoting John. The statement baptized with the Holy Ghost is John's utterance. There is no prophet before John who said it. And you call yourself disciples of John. That means you only came to school of ministry last day. You were not around throughout. You came for the grace. They went around. Say, but John verily baptized the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that is on Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 5, they were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then verse 6, he now went ahead to lay hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and then they spoke with tongues. New converts as mass and prophesied. New converts. So it's not a height of a church, it's the beginning. Don't put out the Spirit's fire by fear. You know, 
so that you won't be labeled. No. We must be a church of the word and the Holy Ghost. 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 There are demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. There are demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. The word and the Holy Ghost. Utterances. Revelations. Power. Demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Fight the good fight of faithfulness. Don't allow the power of God to be in your past. Signs and wonders can't be in your past. You are backsliding. Backsliding is when the testimonies of the power of God are in your past. When was the last time you gave tongues and interpretation? That means you are backsliding. When was the last time you held a healing service and laid hands on the sick? When? When was the last time? If that's not happening, then you have to fight the good fight of faithfulness. You have not been faithful in what he has called you to do. Maybe because where you are, maybe because of the fakes, maybe because you're, you want to build your ministry around something else. It's time to be faithful. It's time to be faithful. Be faithful what God has called you to do. Be faithful with the gift of God in you. Be faithful with the doctrine of Christ, which is what we're talking about anyway. Be faithful with the power of God that has been given to you to be a faithful steward. And so, we must fight the good fight of faith. It also includes contend for the supernatural. Contend for it. A good number of things will be done. A good number of praying. When they were persecuted in the book of Acts, they went to pray. And one of the things they prayed about, they said that signs and wonders will be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Acts 4. Verse 28 through to verse 30. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. We can pray for signs and wonders to be done. We can. Paul prayed the same. Romans 15, 19. Romans 15, 31, 32. You can pray the same. You can pray that the word of God will be preached as it ought to. Colossians 4, 3. And one of the ways it ought to is that signs and wonders will be done in the name of the Holy Servant, Jesus. Can we pray about signs and wonders? Yes, we should. We should pray about it. We should pray that as we preach the gospel and go to the lost, not to show off, not to appear on Facebook and say, see what's happening in our ministry. No, 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 no. no. Not to put pictures. Only two times did Jesus ask people to testify. Twice. He didn't do it more than twice. The first one was the guy who was already in the caves. He's mad. He's, he's, he's bound there. So he says, go and tell your brethren that he has shown you great compassion. The second fellow was the leper. Go show yourself to the priests so that they can admit you amongst people. Because normally lepers are, uh, they are sad people. So on the two instances where I asked them to go and tell what had happened is because they had to be admitted amongst people. Jesus never tells you, come out, come on, come and tell me what happened. No, 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 he doesn't do that. Don't follow the showbiz kind of ministry of the miracles and the power of God. Minister to the sick because you want them healed. Not because you want to put it on Facebook. Are you there? Not because I want to, people to know that something is happening in our ministry. No, no, no. no, no. We, we've left that path of dishonesty. Christ and Christ alone. But do not stop contending for the power of God. A ministry that doesn't contend for the power of God doesn't pray. When you see a ministry given to prayer, even when they are ignorant, they will see the power of God in demonstration. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Be given to prayer. What's your prayer pattern like in your church? I'm saying deep-seated, spirit-filled prayer. We've spoken down on fasting, and we don't see the power of God. Paul fasted. Jesus fasted. Moses fasted. Elijah fasted. So, what other inspiration do you need because of Jesus Christ? Prayer. Someone say, it's not about how long you pray. It's how effective. Stop saying that grammar. What does that mean? They say pray always. Always means all the time. Without ceasing. 
So the length is the effectiveness. That's the length. We give him to prayer. We cannot be heralds of the power of God if we are not giving to prayer. Oh, now I've known the word of God. I don't pray like that. I just give thanks. I can see it. You are giving thanks for your ignorance. You have to pray. Do you know how many instructions Paul said pray for us? He didn't say give thanks for us. He says pray for us. I challenge you, brothers and sisters, that we should contend for the power of God. Be faithful in prayer. Those, in those days, we would do vigil. Ah, you are backsliding. Vigil is not those days. No, vigil is not those days. Oh, Vigil is now. All night prayer. All day prayer. It's not those who are ignorant that pray. It's those who know that pray. Be given to prayer. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Luke 5. Jesus prayed all night. Luke 6, 12. He prayed all night. Luke 5. He went to the wilderness and prayed. 15. All night. He took his disciples to pray. The first hour they slept. The second hour they slept. The third hour they said, keep sleeping. That means he must have prayed three hours. Mm. The day he was to be crucified, why was he praying when he was right there going to die? Because prayer is not about getting things. It's about staying in the will of God. It's fellowship. Be giving to prayer. Be giving to evangelism. When was the last time you hit the street? Not, you know, evangelism, you begin to drum, bro, bam, 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 gun, 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 gun. come on, no, Jesus. Is that evangelism? Hit the streets, lay hands on the sea, cast out demons, announce that Jesus who died, who rose again, heals the sick, raises the dead, hallelujah. Contend for the supernatural. Don't leave this conference and continue. Like before. I want to see you stay up late praying. I want to see you spend three days shut in and pray. You know all those retreats you used to have? Go back to them. Those retreats. Just take some time out. You just with your Bible, teaching, uh, studying materials, and you just pray through. Pray in the Holy Ghost. And direction will come. Direction will come. Things will come. You will, oh my God. Come, yo. There's fire of the, of the Holy Ghost. There's, you know, there's touch light. There's candle light. There's fire. They are not the same. There's a kind of light that comes by fire. And listen to me, ministry power is prayer power. Ministry power is prayer power. Give yourself to prayer. Acts 6, 4. We will give ourselves continually. Pros catereo. To stay there like our life depends on it. To prayer and to the ministry of the word. It is something you can say Jesus was. He was a man of love. He was also a man of prayer. In Luke 3.17, he's been, he's, been, uh, he's been baptized and he's praying. Luke 3.21, he's praying. What's he praying about? He goes to the cross. He's praying. He's always praying. And he's not saying, bless this food, O Lord, for, for Christ's sake. No. He's praying all night. He's praying into hours. You see people today say, they, they, I now have the message. Say, thank you, Father. La, ba, la, ba. Le, be, 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 be. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you for grace. You are, you are backsliding. In fact, it's not backsliding. You are backflipped. It's time to pray. Be faithful in prayer. Be faithful with the power of God. Be faithful with the healing ministry. Be faithful with casting out of demons. Be faithful with supernatural utterances. Be faithful with all of God's word. Hallelujah. You're blessed this morning. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Worship Jesus. I want us to just pray. Very briefly. Lord, you gave me a ministry of the supernatural. I will be faithful. I will be faithful. Be faithful. I won't let the fakes 
put fear in my heart. I won't let the counterfeits make me unfaithful. I will be faithful. I will be faithful with the office you've called me to be a prophet in the local church. I will be faithful to take the message of Jesus with power to the world. I'm going back on my crusades. I'm going back on the village evangelism. I'm going back to the healing meetings. I'm going back to those things. I'm now more effective, sincere, honest. But I stir up the gifts. I stir up the gift of God. Let's pray. I stir up the gift. Outreaches. I contend for the power of God. I am faithful. I preach Christ with power and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. In my church, mention your church name, we do not quench the fire of the Spirit. In my church, we give room for the demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Just listen a bit. Brofas kipa prafan ebani oku kapasifia tikitisi a handika brain de goga deza. Anga da brosu pramananda tafukus kipa le rose na handi atike le prativra han hino no mino no kia tiara nonga ka oko yi krania o jiro ma padara krisa tita heda pruka there's much more you have left behind there's a whole lot you have put aside a whole lot you have put aside but there's much more you have to lift up today and carry yourself for before now, you have let the things I called you to do be done by others. It's now time to retrace your steps and retrace your steps to, to, to do it again and do it again. For you often see the pictures of those things and you ward them away, but they've come back to you today for you to get back in them and get back in them faithfully, get back in them truthfully. Get back in them with sincerity, but get back in them. For when I spoke to you, I spoke to you. Don't doubt that I was the one who spoke to you. For I spoke with you and I spoke to you. You knew it clearly in your heart till doubt started to creep in. You started losing confidence in my call upon your life. But it's time to rise up and get in there now. Get in there now. For, for I am staring hearts who will not be, who will not be half baked. They will be fully formed. I'm staring hearts who, who will be full in the gospel. They will have the fullness of the gospel. And I'm staring your heart too. Not to be tilted on one side or be extreme on another. But to be full of everything that is in my word. So don't allow those pictures of failure to scare you. You did it and it failed. Do it again. For I will confirm my word. I will confirm my call upon your life. Since you didn't set yourself up, I set you up and I stare your heart to do what I've called you to do. You'll be faithful, faithful, faithful in the supernatural. For from this day, there's a restoration of much that you were lost. Of the gifts of the spirit you left behind. You used to see and know things in the spirit. Go back there. Go back there. Go back there. You see and know because you see and know. You see those things and know them. But no show man. No show man. No show man. Do it to bless the church. That's all. You see and know. You see and know. Get back on those crusades. Get back on those crusades. I mean the crusades. The crusades. Where the, the deaf will hear. The blind will see. The lame will walk. Go back there. Go back there. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. You are called to teach. You are also called to do. 
You're called to teach. You're also called to do. You're called to do. Kea kon, kitro ko, mayando. Laka ya tata free. Koma nusa bra. Ha ha. Oh, le mo hunga bra shkori ande. Prekasiana fruko. Mena na mo kuso. Bala la la liko. Kriko nika sembela. Pumro dusa pa. Kita de adosa. Moments of prayer are back. Long moments of prayer. Long moments of prayer. Long moments of prayer. As you pray, you pray at my will and purpose. As you pray, you pray the meetings before they happen. As you pray, you pray out what I intend to do in the earth. Never let your knees stop being bent. Bend them again and again. And give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to it. And you will get back those things that were lost. Signs and wonders are not in your past. They are in your ministry now. They are in your ministry. You never needed entertainment. You never needed it. The charisma, the charisma I gave to you is enough. The charisma I gave to you is enough. You never needed to do other things. Stay with my word. Stay with my spirit. Stay with my power. And there's a harvest of souls that will come. There's a harvest of souls. You will convince hard-hearted people. You will bring even the very obstinate to hear me. Because you will yield to my will. When your obedience is complete, then others will subject to the obedience of Christ. Fully obey my word and give yourself totally to my gospel and the things of my spirit. Never allow the things of the spirit dwindle in your church. Never allow it. Don't kill it. Don't kill it. Stir it up. Stir it up. Oh, but Lord, what about excesses? What about excesses? Excesses mean nothing. Correct it. But don't allow excesses stop you from giving room to the things of the Spirit. There was excess in Corinth, yet Paul said, contend for it. There was excess in Corinth, Paul said, still covet after it. Excesses should not scare you. Excesses are the reasons why you are the pastor. Just correct it and move on. But don't allow excesses stop you from allowing the move of the Spirit. The time is now. The time is now. I sense something strong in my spirit before this conference. And I just said, then I'll drop the microphone. We got into a particular time that we cannot but allow the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. We've got into a tangent where, yes, yes, there have been fakes and excess folks, but you know what? We need to obey God. Obey God. Obey God. And learn the things of the Spirit. Learn them. Don't forget, you have to learn them. And then give yourself to them. Give yourself to them. Give yourself to them. Ministries are being rebirthed here. They are being restored here. They are being renewed here. They are being renewed here. Today is the 8th of August 2019. By 8th of August 2020, there will be a sudden multiplication in churches. I wasn't praying, I was telling you. There will be a sudden multiplication. It's not really sudden. It's a result of prayer. And so you will pray more. You will pray more. And atheists will find their way around you. Cultists will find their way around you. Idol worshippers will find their way around you. Always learn to give the glory to me alone. Amen. Let's just lift our hands and bless them.